morning. Um, welcome to our September South Jersey Men's Club meeting. Um, we're going to start off uh, today with a presentation of some checks to uh, Camden County Hero Scholarship Fund and the uh, Goodwin Holocaust Museum. Um, these are funds that were collected at our law enforcement breakfast back in April. Um, at the time, uh, the 50-50 that we take, uh, that we do there, um, is to be split evenly between the two charities. Um, unfortunately, it was a little sparse this year. There was only uh, a net of $400, and that was after a couple of the winners actually donated back their winnings. Um, so the club has decided uh, to add to that $400, $600, um, for a total of a thousand to be split evenly between the two charities. So I'd like to bring up uh, Stephen DePirian and Jill Burkett from Camden County Hero Scholarship and Peggy David from the Goodwin Holocaust Museum and Education Center. Yeah. I want to thank all of you fellows for letting us take care of you have. This is going to be a big help. We currently have, at this time, two children in college that we take care of and that we have to support. Again, their parents were lost in the line of duty, as we do and take care of. We're going to take care of these two fellows that are currently in college. The third that's coming up next year is going to be a young lady that is going to be going to college. So we do have a need for keeping our coffers filled to take care of this and to take care of what we do as far as supporting those children of firefighters, police, and EMTs when they're lost in the line of duty. So we thank you all for a great job and we appreciate anything that comes along. And. Uh, Keep us in mind, we do have down the road a small three, I believe, more that are in grammar school that will still be coming up, and we hope that we don't have to take care of any more than that. Thanks again. We appreciate you. We really appreciate being uh, brought over today. And have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy, you want to say a few words? Thank you so much. Um, Unfortunately, as we know too well, hate continues to raise its head. Um, for, I think I could say for all of us in this room, knowledge of the Holocaust is right there in our heads. Unfortunately, what we're finding out is that that's not the case for too much of the population. So in this time when we know that anti-Semitism is on the rise, Hatred is out there and so obvious. We really appreciate your support for the Goodwin Holocaust and Education Center, where we do a lot of work with teacher training and direct contact with school children, which is mandated in the state of New Jersey, to ensure that there is greater knowledge of the Holocaust, of what happened, and what can happen when people turn on people just because of how they look, how they love, or how they believe. So thank you very much. We also have a check um, for the uh, Jewish Community Relations Council. Um, it's $175. Um, it is the funds uh, that were collected over and above what we have already remitted to the JCRC um, for uh, Yom HaShoah. Don't forget your dues, guys. I don't know, uh, Stan, um, Schumas? There he is. Stan, how are we doing on dues, uh, roughly? How many people have paid? I know you were... And of course, we've got people this morning I know who were paying because they were asking me about it. So, don't forget your dues. Um, we need you to support us. Um, October. I'll try to do these in order. Um, hopefully, I have them in order. 
October 6th, uh, Remembrance Walk. Um, the JCC is sponsoring a Remembrance Walk. Uh, the walk is from the annex, uh, the Weinberg Commons, I guess it's called, down the road on Springdale. Um, to the JCC, there's a one mile and a two mile. The two mile, I believe, winds through St. Mary's and around. The one mile is straight down Springdale Road. Um, I talked to a few of the members who are going to attend, and um, if you are, there is a sign up. Uh, I think you can attend even if you don't sign up, you, you don't get a shirt and you don't support necessarily the, uh, the walk. Um, but you can sign up downstairs or on the web. Um, just uh, Google it uh, under the uh, JCC website. Um, I think it's $36 for adults, 18 for seniors and children. Um, we're going to try to meet, for those of you who are going to walk, we're going to try to meet at the Weinberg Commons. It's at 9 o'clock. Um, at the steps, there's a few steps that go from the parking lot to the driveway right kind of in the center of that parking lot. We're going to try to meet in that area as a group. Wear your shirt and we'll walk together uh, down to the JCC unless, well, you can do the two mile or the one mile, but obviously until you get to St. Mary's, I think everybody's going to be walking together. So keep that in mind for October 6th. Um, also October 6th, um, I left a couple of these on the tables this morning. Um, Ed Silver, who couldn't make it today, he's not feeling well. Um, we're having a joint uh, Eagles-Jets game with Adith Emanuel. Uh, it's at Dooney's Pub in Voorhees. It's in that shopping center at the end where uh, Lowe's is, I think, across from Virtua. Um, it's at 1 p.m. It's a $20 buffet lunch, which includes beer. Wow. I know you guys will be there for the beer anyway. Um, so I'd like to, Ed asked, Ed asked me if I would get an idea of how many people are uh, thinking about going. And please don't raise your hand to uh, make me feel good. Uh, but if you're thinking about going, I'd like to see some hands. Um, you know, you don't have to stay for the whole game. You can leave at halftime if you, you know, want to go home and watch the rest at home or whatever. Um, one, two, three, four, half a dozen maybe. Think about it, guys. It should be fun, and we'll meet some people that we don't uh, normally uh, have at our meetings. So that's that's October 6th. Um, yes? It sounds like you pay when you get there. What does it say on here? Includes beer. Come early to meet and greet and get a table. Questions, Ed Silver. If you want one of these, there's some floating around the tables. Uh, checks made out to Temple Adith Emanuel Men's Club. I guess you pay when you get there. Um, but I guess that's probably why they wanted an idea of how many people we're going to have. Um, October 8th, um, Science Museum. Who's going to talk about that? Mike or um, Abe? It was just delegated to me. Mike. Mike, a visit to the uh, Philadelphia yeah, something science, science museum manufacturing. It's kind of redundant because we've had two emails go out uh, several weeks ago and then earlier this week that the trip to the Science History Institute will be on Tuesday, October 8th, and spouses are welcome. And for those of you that haven't been to it, I feel like um, over and over I've, I've talked about it. We had a speaker here several months ago from the Science History Institute. And it's um, between the Revolutionary War Museum and Independence Hall, and it's three full buildings, so you probably never even knew it was there. Their marketing stinks, it really does, but it's an amazing museum. They do a tremendous amount of work. They have an amazing library. And we were able to take up to 20 people at a time for a trip, and you can sign up. It's very expensive, though. Uh, two two dollars. We can arrange for loans. Okay. I'll sponsor someone if you can't. Okay. So do sign up for it. I'll let them know if we have a group or not for that time. It's at 10:30 in the morning. You take the high speed line there. You could drive there. There's parking. We can carpool. Any questions? Yeah, I got a complaint. It's our tip-off. Called Nigger that night. 
Well, yeah, that's why it's in the morning, Bill. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to uh, take a minute and talk about your... Um, oh, the book? The book. Oh, how many people ever attended a law breakfast? Ever? Okay, watch the hands go down. How many attend did it when we did it in this building? That was a long time ago. One of the keynote speakers we had was the United States Marshal for New Jersey, Jim Plosis. Uh, Jim Plosis is an interesting fellow. Uh, he was a municipal policeman, then was elected sheriff of Cape May County, then was appointed by the President of the United States to be U.S. Marshal. At the end of that term, he ended up being head of the New Jersey Cas Parole Commission, and now he's chairman of the New Jersey Casino Commission. It's hard to keep track. He really wrote a book with all the benefits uh, proceeds to go to the United States Marshal Survivors Benefit Fund. Now, what he asked me to do was to tell people that if you go onto Amazon, you can click on that you want to buy, but you don't have to, that you can buy the digital edition. And then when you go there, you can download a sample. If you've downloaded a sample that costs zero, then you could do a review. Your review could be good book or anything, anything at all. And when they get a certain number, Amazon will contribute $500 to the U.S. Marshall Survivor Benefit Fund. I wholeheartedly recommend that you either buy the book, buy the text, or just download the sample. But whatever you do, do a review. Any questions? Do you know whether it's included in, in the Amazon subscription, which is... No, I don't might be free possibly I don't know say have a look if you're if you subscribe to Amazon and my wife does there's a million or a couple million books that are free now um, with that subscription it's ten dollars a month for the subscription oh there's one thing I did forget to mention US Marshals remember when we did something with the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for a few how many people made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for fugitive safe surrender? It was one of the first ones in the country. And on page, I was reading, I'm reading, and all of a sudden I see on page 481. Last page. Or not 481, but it did mention about the South Jersey Men's Club. How about that? Oh, can't find it. But, but really, <laughs> we believe you, Mike. It, it says in here when they're talking about the U.S. Marshall Program for Fugitive Safe Surrender, where thousands of people turned themselves in in Camden City. 1,385. That was one of the judges. That's right. I forgot. Thank you. Uh, Irv Snyder was a judge at the time there. And they expected about four or 500 total. And I saw the, the, the I call, actually I called the marshal and asked him how it went. He said, we, we blew through our food budget on the first day. And I think it was supposed to be four days? Yeah, it was four days including the weekend. Yes. So we, like, like this, this is the way we do things, like this. We went and we made thousands of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And um, it's mentioned in the book. So we're famous again. Thank you. I'll have it. Uh, I'll leave it up here if anybody wants to take a look at it. Mike, the exact title of the book? Jersey Lawman. Jersey Lawman. Jim Plosis. I'll have it up here. Thanks, Mike. So that's October 8th. Um, October 10th. Um, prep for the food sort. The food sort is actually on the 13th. Uh, I'll just quickly, the food sort is uh, all the synagogues, I don't know, some other organizations collect food at their locations. They bring it all here. Um, I think this is the first year that we're actually doing it in this building. We did it in the, uh, in the annex the last couple years. Um, all the food is being delivered here on the 8th. And we always have a dozen, 18 people from the um, men's club um, making up boxes. This is, this is the pre-sort. This is on the 10th. In the social hall here, uh, 9 a.m. Um, I'd like you, um, David, are you, are, you going, are you taking names for this one? Or? Abe. Abe has it. Abe has it. Abe, would you let Abe know that you're... 
Right there is the, the oh. sheets are going around. Sheets are going around already? Yeah, give it to me. That's it. No, this is science. It's all over. That's all of them? Okay. Please, if you would, give us a hand. That, mo that morning at 9 o'clock, if you come at 9, we're going to work in the social hall, making up boxes, bringing food off the trucks, if you're capable um, of lifting. Um, at 10 o'clock, we're going to build the sukkah. And that's something we've always done for since Dave was born. You want to talk? Sure. You want to talk about uh, building this sukkah? Uh, you don't have to be a mechanic. Uh, there's all kinds of little jobs to be done. Uh, we, we like tall people because they can reach up and put the uh, straw on the ceiling. Anyway, go ahead, Dave. Watch it. Yeah, I have uh, two things to talk about. <clears throat> First is putting up the sukkah. We do this every year, and we have a great time doing it. Uh, it usually takes about two hours. We start at about 10 o'clock in the morning and finish around noon, at which time the JCC buys us a uh, bagel sandwich over at the uh, downstairs. Um, I have a sign-up list that I'm going to be sending around. Um, now, then about a week later, on uh, the uh, 23rd, I guess it's almost two weeks later, we take the sukkah down. And again, the same thing. If we come at 10 o'clock in the morning and we bring the sukkah down, at the end we get that bagel sandwich. What I want to do is, is send uh, this around and hopefully everybody will uh, take it, hopefully sign it, pass it on to the next table. We need to know how many people are going to show up. We usually get at least uh, 10 to a dozen people and, and it's usually fun for the people that show up. So let me turn to take this around over here and then come up to the next item. The, the other thing that I'm going to talk about is that uh, the uh, JCC has a couple of very big events in the year uh, that we try to participate in. And this one is the Arts, Books and Cultural Festival. Every year I take a look at what's done uh, at the Arts, Books and Cultural Festival. I'm a patron, I go to everything, uh, to see if there's something that men might like. And I came up with one that I think a lot of you will like. And the reason I'm bringing this up is if you get at least 10 people um, willing to go, and we buy the tickets at one time, I can get a 10% discount. Now, the thing that uh, I'm uh, recommending that we go to as a, as a group is the following. It's called Underdogs, the Philadelphia Eagles' Emotional Road to Super Bowl Victory. And it's got a little story here about the guy that uh, wrote it and what, what's in the book. But uh, obviously we have an awful lot of football fans here, and particularly uh, Eagles fans. So this is something that I think a lot of you would be interested in attending. The uh, event is on November the 10th, it's a Sunday, and it's at 11.30 in the morning. So uh, I don't know if we're having a board meeting or not. Uh, the uh, board has meetings every second Sunday. Uh, in the month, in which I think this one is. So, at 11.30 in the morning, board members, you're already here. Hopefully you'll, you'll come to this event. Uh, and those of you that are not board members, this is Sunday morning. If you have nothing else doing, this would be a great way to spend Sunday morning. So what I'd like you to do is, uh, basically I have a lot of information, email and phone. Just put your name down. If I have enough people here that, uh, that uh, I can buy the uh, 10 tickets, I will buy them, and at the next uh, monthly meeting, which is before November the uh, uh, 10th, you, I will be handing out the tickets at this meeting. Yes? Tell them who the author is. Pardon? Tell them who the wrote the book. Oh, the, the guy that wrote the book is Zach Berman. Does anybody? Uh, sure. Yeah, I know. You know Zach Berman? Okay. Um, I, I'll, let, me, let me put underneath the uh, brochure uh, announcement so that if you want to read it, you, you can. But I, hopefully you can sign up and hopefully we get at least 10 people here that are interested. And again, let me pass. That's the 10th, and then that weekend, the Sunday morning, uh, the 13th, we're actually doing the sorting with, there'll be 100 people here at the social hall doing the sorting. And wear your shirts for that. Um, you don't, wear, you can wear your shirts obviously on, on the pre-sort also, why not? Um, if you want to wear, if you have your old white shirts, wear them because the sukkah 
we usually manage to get a little mud on ourselves or depending on what it's like out there. Gloves, uh, screwdriver, they, they usually have tools, but gloves sometimes help. Um, Dave, uh, I think that's pretty much it for the... Sure, again? You gotta keep it short though, Mike. Very short, very short. Is this short enough? That's short, yeah. Hey fellas, listen up everybody. There's a whole lot of folks here who kind of were mixed up about the men's club. We are not a breakfast club. You have to do something. You might say, well, I hurt, I don't walk well. If you just come and, and you're taking this and putting it over here, and that's it, that means somebody else who's do doing 10, 15 things doesn't have to do that. Anything that you can do, any small little thing, makes it easier for the guys who are able to do more. So I implore you, get off your butt. If you don't do hands-on things, you are capable. I hope nobody's insulted, but that's what we do, insult. And we do things. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Now, I, I agree 100%. That's, uh, I think that was Marty's expression. We're not a breakfast club. Although we do put a pretty good breakfast out there. Um, Dave uh, Schwarz, would you like to introduce our speaker? Good morning. Good morning. Andrew Demchik is here. Thank you very much for schlepping all the way over from Pennsylvania. I'm going to read a short bio. Andrew Demchik is Director of Development and Strategic Partnerships for AJC, the American Jewish Committee, Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey region. Responsible for all fundraising activities, outreach to the corporate community, and special events for the country's leading global Jewish advocacy organization. He has spent his career working on behalf of Israel and the Jewish community. He is a former regional director of the American Friends of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, associate director of American Associates at Gurion University of the Negev, Mid-Atlantic director of Boys Town Jerusalem and has held posts as national development director for Maccabi USA, sponsor of the US Maccabi team, and Regional Director for the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia. An accomplished writer, Demchik also worked for the U.S. Army Recruiting, Recruiting's Midwest Recruiting Command as a writer-editor. He has a journal, journalism degree from Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, and is a proud graduate of Philadelphia's Central High School Andrew and his wife, Rachel, have three children and live in Upper Dublin, PA. Please welcome Andrew Demchek. Thank you, David. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I want to apologize in advance. I'm going to read some of my presentation because it includes statistics. And I like to get them right. I don't like to just... And um, I am proud to be here today. I have some connections, some family connections to South Jersey. Uh, my wife's family, uh, if any of you knew Carl Solomon, Carl and Beverly Solomon from Accor Shalom. Uh, my wife's cousin's son is a proud graduate of the preschool here at the JCC, and he started kindergarten this year. And I coached uh, three teams that won gold medals at the Junior Maccabi Games when they were held here in South Jersey with uh, three of my children. Um, we live in an interconnected world, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, anti-Semitism and the problem in Europe, transition to here in the United States, and also share some information about AJC. I'm not sure what you know about us. There are some cards on your uh, tables, who we are and what we do. And uh, it's a small Jewish world, and just totally off the subject, you mentioned Zach Berman, uh, the author. Zach Berman was my son's counselor at camp in the Poconos. And when the Eagles were in the Super Bowl, uh, when they won the Super Bowl, my son happened to be in Tel Aviv doing his semester abroad. Calls into WIP, um, tells Zach who he is, Zach remembers him from camp, and he says, okay, Alex, you're on the line. Next, we have a caller from... Uh, calling us all the way from Tel Aviv, Alex Demchik and my son, without thinking, spurts out, 
world effing champions. Thank God there was a nine second delay on the radio. You hear some silence and then you hear Zach Berman say, Alex, you can't say that on the radio. Next caller. Okay, so that's, that's my interconnected story for today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Thanks to uh, my capable AV guy, Randy, we're going to hopefully show a couple brief videos, two minutes each, just to kind of put things into context for you. So this is a defining moment for the Jewish people, a uh, moment of uncertainty in the world, turmoil, discord. History is going to judge us by how we respond. Now, a week goes by without tragic news. Pittsburgh, Poway, Berlin, Paris. Anti-Zionism is increasing on college campuses, and it's found its way into the halls of Congress. Anti-Semitism is everywhere. Um, in our interconnected world, every one of us has a choice to make. Will we stand up? Will we be able to answer the call? At AJC, our choices are clear. We choose to combat anti-Semitism, extremism. We choose to stand up for Israel's right to exist and to advocate for Israel on the world stage. And we choose to champion democracy and pluralism and outreach to other religious and ethnic communities. AJC is on the front lines. We have 22 offices in the United States, 13 foreign offices, Paris, Warsaw, Berlin, Brussels, Buenos Aires, and Jerusalem. We're around the globe, and we have connections in almost 100 countries around the world. You'll find us on social media. In today's world, you have to be on social media. We have over 800,000 followers on our Facebook and Twitter accounts, and that puts us right in the middle of the conversation. AJC has been referred to, and you may have heard this before, as the State Department of the Jewish People because of our outreach and our connections. We serve as a bridge between governments and the Jewish people. And this is really important to emphasize, and that is our unique bipartisan and nonpartisan nature. We don't trend towards one way or the other. We're bipartisan because that's the only way we're able to maintain the access that we have in Congress, with the administration, with governments, with diplomats. We're seen as an honest broker because of our nuance in an age where there is, almost seems like there is no such thing as nuance. Because of our nuanced approach to diplomacy. Um, just to give you an idea of just a little bit who we are, I'm gonna ask Randy to play our first video, AJC Defining Our World. Two minutes. <clears throat> Hate crimes are up in most major cities. More than half were anti-Jewish. Far more than hate crimes targeting any other religious group. It's actually quite fierce that anti-Semitism is on the rise. The thousands of Jews fleeing Europe amidst the toxic hate. Global community. 
and he seems always stood by Israel. We need the clear moral voice of the American Jewish Committee. You have fought for the core values that drive democracies. Let us choose Rahman, meaning compassion and caring about others. part of our staat system, meaning the national interests of my home country. The security of Israel and the Jewish people are not negotiable to us. History has just been made here at the AJC Global Forum. Okay, thank you. Lights, please. Um, thank you. That's very briefly who we are. We do our work through outreach and diplomacy at the highest levels with local, state, national, and global leaders. We are, have a presence on social media. And we also build coalitions with other religious and ethnic groups. And that's how we do our work. Last week, a report was published by a very prestigious organization on white supremacy around the world. And this report chronicled how American white supremacists are exporting their unique form of hatred around the world. Again, we're in a global world, and it's easy to share this information on the internet. And according to this report, the collaboration has led to a cross-pollination of ideas fueling a rise in hate crime, anti-Semitism in the U.S. and Europe, as minority, minority communities, Jews, Muslims, all immigrants, are threatened and killed. Um, today's topic then, using the lessons of Europe to face the challenges here in the United States. And the crucial question that needs to be asked is, is anti-Semitism in this country different than anti-Semitism in Europe, the traditional home of anti-Semitism? If so, how? We've been tracking this for the last 20 years in Europe. As I mentioned earlier, AJC has offices in Paris, Berlin, Brussels, and all throughout the, all throughout the continent. And specifically, let's look at Germany and France, where it's been more and more of a problem. France is the country of human rights, but it's also the country that gave us the Dreyfus Affair. Germany, with a mantra of never again, where following the Holocaust, people thought it could never happen. Now public officials in Berlin are saying it's not safe to, for Jews to be walking around wearing kippot. Never again. So yeah, Jewish communities around the world are concerned. Europe is uh, really facing an onslaught that we thought we'd never see again after the Holocaust. In France, the problem didn't start with the hyper supermarket killings or Charlie Hebdo. But here's where, this, here's where I want to share some alarming statistics. It seems that the rise in anti-Semitism in France particularly started in the year 2000. In 1997 and 1998, there were 83 and 84 anti-Semitic acts recorded. In the year 2001, that number jumped to 350. Since then, since 2001, France has had between 400 and 1,000 anti-Semitic acts every single year. Month doesn't go by without reading about someone who's murdered in their home by an, a neighbor because they were a Jew, someone thrown off of a balcony. What's particularly startling is that of all the reported hate crimes in France, over 50% are targeted at the Jewish community. 
Think about that. 1% of the population, 50% of the hate crimes. European uh, Agency of the Fundamental Human Rights, a few months ago, looked at the Jewish perspective. 90% of the Jews surveyed declared that they themselves had noticed anti-Semitic acts over the past few years. One out of five Jews, one out of five, had been personally assaulted. In Germany, 85% of the respondents characterized anti-Semitism as a very big problem. 89% said the problem had become worse in recent years. Anti-Semitic acts just last year alone rose 20% to almost 1,800 individual acts in Germany. 1,800. Country that said never again following the Holocaust. Anti-Semitic crimes rose 86% and police attribute 89% of all the anti-Semitic crimes to right-wing extremists. AJC and our office in Berlin don't believe that. We don't believe that 89% of those acts were by right-wing extremists. We dispute the numbers because we know, based on our surveys, based on anecdotal information, the majority of those acts happen to be perpetrated by the Muslim community. Okay? Someone with Muslim extremist views. And these problems aren't confined to France and Germany. It's happening in Sweden, it's happening in Hungary, it's happening in Italy. Populism is on the rise. Right-wing governments are looking for scapegoats and naturally, who's the first person they're going to look at? The Jews. Germany and France are the only countries in Europe that have appointed a governmental delegate specifically to fight anti-Semitism. They've adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism. Some of you have a piece on your table, it's a blue booklet, that describes that definition. And the definition is important because when countries adopt the definition of anti-Semitism, that strengthens laws. So now people can be prosecuted for this hate speech. People can be prosecuted and it's spelled out very clearly what constitutes anti-Semitism? And no longer can they hide it behind the cloak of anti-Zionism. We love the Jewish people, we just have a problem with the Zionists. It's one and the same. And the definition of anti-Semitism includes anti-Zionism in that definition. In 2020, European Congress is going to address this. There's been a significant number, I believe it's up to 18 European countries have adopted that working definition. 18 countries where there's strengthened laws against hate. In France, BDS has been prohibited. The boycott, divestment and sanctions movement that seeks to delegitimize Israel. It's been prohibited in theory. In reality, it's still going on. Every day you read about another boycott wine from the West Bank, label it from the West Bank. It's blatant anti-Semitism. But those efforts need to be encouraged, they need to be increased. And internationally, the threats posed uh, by anti-Semitism are taking on other roles. Hezbollah is allowed to operate around the world. There's this, fi this fiction that there is a military wing and the social wing, it's all one and the same, and we know that. When Hezbollah marches in Germany, in the streets where they have permits, what do you hear them chanting? Death to Israel, death to the Jews, the Holocaust never happened. That's the reality of today. So, is that expanding in this country? Sadly, I think it is. I was in Charlottesville with my daughter in the quad where we saw those marchers with the tiki torches chanting, Jews will not replace us. The school founded by Thomas Jefferson, Jews will not replace us. And it gave me chills standing on that quad. And these are, the quad is surrounded by residences. 
top students, if you're a top achieving student at the University of Virginia, you're lucky to be able to live on the quad with the professors. And that's where they were chanting, Jews will not replace us. Pittsburgh's Tree of Life. We know what happened there and we're coming up on the one year anniversary. Our worst nightmares came true and attacked the worst attack ever on Jews in this soil. And statements were made, thoughts and prayers. And exactly six months later, Chabad of Poway in San Diego, another murder. Today, Jews aren't only killed in Paris, they're not only killed in Brussels, Copenhagen, Pittsburgh, and San Diego. Jewish students on campus are no longer safe. They're dealing with anti-Semitism. It's not just in Europe. It's in London. It's in New York, Boston, Philadelphia. We're not dealing with the anti-Zionism in Le Monde or Dizit in Berlin or The Guardian in England, but the New York Times publishes a cartoon, a caricature of the President of the United States being led by a dog with the face of Israel's Prime Minister. The New York Times. Is this the 1930s or is this 2019? Today in the, today in the United States, not just in Britain's Labor Party, but in the United States Congress, a congresswoman can play anti, on anti-Semitic tropes, Jewish influence and money, and get away with it. And get away with it in this country. Today, women's rights. There's something called intersectionality. The women's movement says that you can't support women's rights and be a Jew and support Israel and the Jewish people. They're incompatible. Hodge, it links a hodgepodge of issues and other things, protests against sexual violence. There's no place for Jews in that because of intersectionality, because of the oppression of the Palestinian people. Three sources of anti-Semitism. The radical left, that's like groups that are on campus, the Jews for Justice in Palestine, Students for Democratic Palestine, the Women's March. Second source is extremists, Islamic extremists, responsible for shootings at army recruiting stations in Texas, California, Orlando. And then there's the far right. Let me tell you a quick story about someone that I've known for over 20 years, someone that was in that hate movement, and how he got involved. And it, be, it starts before the age of the internet. Tom Martinez was a 17-year-old Edison High School in Philadelphia. In the 70s, that neighborhood was starting to change. No longer were the working class white people who had lived in that neighborhood. No longer did they have the job security of working in the factories and elsewhere. Minority communities were encroaching on the neighborhood. And the high school was a source of real conflict between the races. 17-year-old Tom comes to school one day, sees his, one of his best friends get stabbed. They look at him and they say, you're next. He goes home that night and he's watching television. I'm sure many of you in this room remember the Tom Snyder show. And Tom Snyder is interviewing this young, well-dressed man, put together, very articulate, a young fellow named David Duke. And Tom hears David Duke talking about replacement ideology, how minorities are replacing the white man, affirmative action is taking away their jobs, taking away their future, and he says, you know, that makes sense, that makes sense to me. He's talking to me. So he gets a phone number, he, he sees the number on the screen, he calls, and he becomes involved in the, in the Klan. And it wasn't violent enough, so he becomes involved in a group called The Order. And The Order, if you had ever seen a movie called Talk Radio about a talk show host in Denver named Alan Berg. The order killed him. The order had plans to blow up synagogues in Hayden Lake, Idaho. Long story short, Tom Martinez gets caught passing counterfeit money for the order and gets arrested. And rather than going into a witness protection program, he realizes that 
this is wrong. This is not who I was brought up to be. So he turns state's witness and helps bring down this terrorist organization. That was one person. Now fast forward to today. The internet is everywhere. Kids spend countless hours every day surfing the web. And they find these really slick videos. And again, it's music, it's lively, it's exciting. It's a, a reason to belong. So take that Tom Martinez story and multiply it by thousands. That's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with today. What can we do about it? First step, immediately put pressure on government officials to unequivocally, unequivocally condemn anti-Semitism. Not there are good people on both sides, but this is wrong. This is not consistent with our values. This is not who we are as Americans. Okay? Zero tolerance. When AJC opened an office in Paris in the early 2000s, they met with President Chirac. And the president told them that anti-Semitism doesn't exist in Paris. It's hooliganism. It's criminals. It's not here. It's not a problem. And they turned a blind eye. In this country, same thing. We have to demand a clear, coherent strategy for dealing with it. AJC is working on the state level with state legislators to adopt laws, hate, anti-hate laws, protecting religiously affiliated institution laws. Okay, so it has to be at the state level and the national level. Next, confront it without any exceptions and depoliticize. Take it out of the political discussion. It's a bipartisan issue. It's not one side is for it, one side's against. Everyone has to be together on this. So depoliticize it. Hatred of Israel comes from the far left on the college campuses, but it also comes from the far right through all the conspiracy theories. Don't have to go on about that. In Europe, it's a little bit different. Over the last 13 years, all the anti-Semitic acts have been in the name of jihad, okay? They're, they're addressing it, and there's one thing that you can do. And a year ago, a year ago October, people stepped forward following the heinous acts at the Tree of Life Synagogue. And you heard in that first video, show up for Shabbat, the hashtag, show up for Shabbat. We didn't know, when we created that program, we didn't know what was gonna happen. But we encouraged people to show up for the following Shabbat at their synagogue and make a statement that this will not define us, that we stand together as one. It turned out to be the largest ever, ever in history, public display on behalf of the Jewish community. Over two million people used that hashtag, show up for Shabbat. I attended services with the Consul General of Mexico who brought her husband and her two young daughters because she thought it was important to show their support. So, Randy, brief video. I remember hearing the news about what happened in Pittsburgh. You couldn't believe it. It was our worst nightmare. Then we thought, what could we, what could AJC say and do? People were just in shock. AJC decided that only action would do. We began to work on a plan to galvanize Jewish communities and all our allies in an expression of unity and defiance. We called the show for Shabbat. We got the word out on social media. They called on Jews and those of all faiths, along with our partners around the globe, elected officials, religious and civic leaders and diplomats, to flock the synagogues the coming Shabbat. We knew our partners on the ground would show up, but what we didn't expect was for this to become a mass movement. So you saw these huge crowds pouring into Shabbat services. The New York Center is filled to standing room only capacity, lines stretching out the door, more people than at high holiday services. Leaders and people of goodwill across the country and around the world attended services to support the Pittsburgh Jewish community and all of American Jewry. Everyone who plays a part in AJC's global Jewish advocacy, our inter-ethnic, inter-religious, and international diplomacy, 
came together to make this massive effort possible. And show up for Shabbat quickly became the largest expression of solidarity with the Jewish community in American history. More than 250 million people engaged with the hashtag on social media platforms. Hundreds of synagogues across America and around the globe. Open their doors to people of all faiths. Hundreds of Christian, Muslim, Hindu, and other faith leaders took part. As people in over 80 countries joined the campaign. Rallying around the social media hashtag, show up for Shabbat. Now we're feeling that there's a solidarity, there's a sense that we're all in this together. More than 100 media outlets, including CNN, NBC, Fox News, New York Times, The Washington Post, USA Today, and NPR, all covered the initiative. Federal, state, and local elected officials attended, and dozens of elected officials from both parties joined, from Nancy Pelosi to Paul Ryan, international leaders from Benjamin Netanyahu to Tony Blair, led support. As did public personalities like Ariana Huffington, Andy Cohen, Isaac Perlman, and Maya Bialik. The AJC has a program called Show Up for Shabbat, and they're encouraging Jews, and they're also encouraging non-Jews who want to do something to show their support for the Jewish community and all communities who um, feel threatened. The outpouring of love and support offered American Jews a glimmer of light in the darkness of that terrible week. As countless small acts of empathy from friends and allies combined to create a true sense of unity and hope. And even when that hope is tested by atrocities, like the attack on the synagogue near San Diego and assaults on Jews elsewhere, we will stand united with all who share our values. Together, millions of people around the world sent a powerful message. Hate will never prevail. Okay. Um, on your tables, if you want to show up for Shabbat this year, this October, here's some information, and I hope you'll all go... Stand with the Jewish community and show up for Shabbat. Third study, okay, we were talking about how to stop this insidious spread of anti-Semitism. Next step is to stop uh, finding excuses. Listen to the victims. They feel they've been abandoned. When you hear things like, eh, this is just importing the conflict with Israel. They bring it on themselves. This isn't our battle. It is. Jews are just the canary in the coal mine, and we know that throughout history. Fourth step is to engage civil society and build coalitions. This is a hallmark of AJC. You saw in one of the videos a group of people standing on a stage. One of them was Rabbi Jeffrey Meyer from Tree of Life Synagogue. This was from our global forum this past June. Rabbi Jeffrey Meyer from Tree of Life. Reverend Eric Manning from Mother Bethel AME in Charleston, site of an atrocity. The Archbishop of Washington, the heads of the Latter Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Church and other civil society leaders standing together to say, we are one. In Philadelphia and in this, our region, AJC sponsors the Latino Jewish Coalition, bringing together leading figures from both communities. The United States is gonna be 20% Latino in the next few years. I don't know if you're aware of that statistic or not. It's an important demographic to reach out to. 20% of the members of Congress will be Latino. So we sponsored the Latino Jewish Coalition, the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, bringing moderate voices together. We sponsor a group of evangelical Christians, the Bucks County Christian Coalition. St. Joseph's University Institute for Jewish Catholic Relations was founded with AJC. And in New Jersey, there's a Hindu-Jewish coalition. Anti-Semitism is not a problem just for the Jews. It's a problem for society. If left unchecked, it eats society out from the inside. Together, we can work to combat it. There's one more step you can take. We're not gonna show this video, but a major initiative of AJC right now is getting Hezbollah named a terrorist organization in its entirety. And when countries name it as a terrorist organization, one important thing happens. Under law, you can freeze their funds. They can't spread any more hate, any more anti-Semitism. So, the First Amendment is important. We all value and treasure the First Amendment, but you have to combat hate speech on the internet. 
Hate speech, as we've seen too many times, leads to actions, and the actions typically target the Jewish community. So, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And for me, this is personal. When David introduced me, you heard, you know, it sounded like I couldn't hold a job. I've had so many different jobs in the Jewish community, but it's because I love Israel, I love the Jewish community. And I've been given incredible opportunities. And I think for me, when I say it's personal, it started when I was born. I was born in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. My father was in the artillery. And there was a constant stream of people coming into the room. And my mother couldn't understand why suddenly her little baby Andy was so popular. Until one day someone came in and said, you know, I've never seen a Jew baby before. And they wanted to see if I had horns. And they wanted to see if I had a little tail growing out of the back. So that's when it began for me. I'm proud to work on behalf of the Jewish community. I'm proud to work on behalf of Israel. And I'm especially proud to work for such an impactful organization as AJC. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to tell you about it. And as a development person, it's really important to me that I came in under budget time-wise so I can get you guys out of here and to go home and watch the Eagles. Yes. Any questions from anyone about... Oh, sir. Class number. 232. Yamo. There you go. The Yamo hats from Central. Sir. What about Bernie Sanders? He is hating us. Repeat the question. Can you repeat the question? Bernie Sanders. Oh, Ber Bernie Sanders? Well, AJC discusses policies, not personalities. Um, we try not to make statements about individuals, preferring instead just to talk about what these individuals may stand for. And we're not shy about calling people out. When they call for the destruction of Israel, we'll speak up. When he'll say that Israel, we should stop giving them money, we disagree. But as far as getting into the individual personalities, that, that's a rabbit hole that we really don't want to go down. Sir? What was the uh, AJC's response to the Muslim organization in Philly that permitted the kids to sing? Thank you. Off their heads? The, the question was, what was our response to the mosque in Philadelphia that put on the play? And I didn't plant this question, but this is, to me, one of the best examples of how effective AJC could be. For those of you who aren't aware of it, there was a mosque in North Philadelphia that put on a play. Kindergarten kids dressed up, and they were, they were dressed up as Hamas terrorists, killing Jews. They sang about jihad, about killing the Jews. Organizations across the spectrum came out and said, this is terrible, this is terrible, it's awful, they should be condemned. AJC took a different approach. What was one more statement going to do, other than just adding on to the outrage in the community? But through the AJC Circle of Friends, our Muslim Jewish group, which includes imams, leading figures in the Jewish community, one of our partners, Imam Musin Salam, went to that mosque and he said, brother, not only have you upset the Jewish community, you're now impacting the Muslim community because Philadelphia is painting us with that brush. It's not right. So in a quiet, measured manner, he spoke to the mosque. The mosque, in working with the Human Relations Council of Pennsylvania, the mosque made a public apology and the man responsible was fired. That is impact. That is more than making a statement. That is affecting change. And that's what AJC does by building these coalitions and having dialogue in a reasoned manner, not being dogmatic about it, but speaking. And I like to say that if we can't stand shoulder to shoulder, at least we can speak face to face. Follow up, is there an educational program that went into that mosque and into that school to reteach uh, what that teacher had taught these kids? Um, that is not within our purview. I know that the State Human Relations Council is working with them to affect that change, but that's a little bit outside of our, outside of our purview. Thank you for your purview.
Sir. Sure. Sure. When anti Semitic attacks come in different locations, synagogues, etc., uh, and the news media enhances it, how do we protect ourselves from lone wolves in synagogues and different groups? <laughs> that, that's a good question. That's a great question, and uh, I think the, the question was, well, how, how do we protect ourselves from lone wolf attacks on synagogues and Jewish people? And I think the answer is by people being aware, by monitoring hate speech. There's organizations that do nothing but monitor hate speech on the Internet, and they've developed um, parameters, they have a profile, and it's really, it's really inherent on all of us. When you hear something like that and it seems a little bit off, to report it. I, I think the, the phrase that you see on television is, if you see something, say something. Right. It's no different with anti-Semitism. Two more. Nelson? According to the New York State Civil Rights Commission, the number of hate crimes in New York City has increased to 60% against Jews in particular. It's not just coming from Muslims, it's coming from African Americans too. We're failing. With all the Jews in New York, they can't control something like that, so what are you doing about it? Well, again, we're, we're building coalitions, working with the, work. the black community. It's not working. What else are you doing about it? What are we doing? We're, we're strengthening laws, trying to work with our legislators to strengthen laws. We're trying to make sure that the light shines on some of these issues and not try to sweep it under the rug. We're, we're calling out the perpetrators when we can. Um, AJC was responsible for the formation over this past summer of the Black Jewish Caucus, Congressional Caucus. Uh, Lee Zeldin and others are uh, working to start dialogue at the highest levels. I mean, you have to start somewhere. We're doing it on the grassroots, but it affects, you know, we're talking about societal change. But better reporting, I think, and uh, it's a problem. It's a very, it's a huge problem in New York. In the meantime, the hate crimes against Jews and others, but particularly Jews, is increasing in numbers every year. It doesn't seem like we're succeeding as an organization, as a religion, to prevent that. I, I can't disagree with that. It's, it's a frightening trend. But we have to, we have to start somewhere. And for us, we, we're starting with dialogue. We're starting with getting it out there with report, better reporting, better understanding, and better laws to combat it when it does happen. Thank you. And. Pick, pick one. Last, last question. Um, does uh, AKC have outreach to college campuses to help reverse the PDS and anti-Zionist trends and yes. promoting Hamas? I, I can tell you very, very briefly, um, AJC has a presence on the college campuses. We work with existing organizations like Hillel, to um, teach uh, students about our advocacy models, train them on how to engage with other populations. And we realized, and this was just a few years ago, we came to the realization that, yeah, it's wonderful what we do on college campuses, but it's too late at that point. Kids are, they get on campus and they really aren't aware of what they can and should be doing. AJC a few years ago started a program called Leaders for Tomorrow. And the Leaders for Tomorrow program identifies high-performing high school students, 10th and 11th graders, before they go to college. We train them. There's seven sessions, seven standalone sessions, history of Israel, what it means to be Jewish in America today, how to build coalitions, how to do advocacy for themselves, so that when they get to college, they have a skill set already in place so they can deal with students for justice in Palestine, and organizations like that, Israel Apartheid Week. So through education, we start in high school, and it goes all the way through the continuum, and, th and that's what we can do. And so we are on the campuses, working with already existing organizations, because there's no point in recreating a wheel if someone's already there and effective. Thank you. Thank you. Would you, would you stay up here for a minute? Certainly. Dave, David, David, you want to come up? and? Yeah, sure. Come on up. Let's move over. So we'd like to present you with a uh, certificate Mic of appreciation. Microphone. You got two of them. You want one. Hello, testing. Um, we'd like to present you with the certificate of appreciation from the club and one year membership. Come back and see us sometime for breakfast. Thank you, very David. Much. Thank you for uh, bringing welcome. another great speaker to the club. Um, we also have.
Uh, Stan, you want to come up with, uh, we'd like you to draw the uh, winner of the 50-50 oh, yeah. oh. lottery. Pressure's on. Okay, just go on. So this, this uh, I don't know, how much is it today? $37 is the winning share. The last oh, three numbers, wrong please. Wrong color. Wrong color. Oh. No, that's, no, no, no. Yeah. Oh, he's got the blue one. The winning numbers are 8, 2, 1. Last three numbers. 8, 2, 1. Come on down. That's not the right number. Anybody? Wait a minute. i got to see. Maybe I won. It's a little bit Now I'm Oh, we have a winner.